Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, the Lord's got me doing some other Bible studies, a good, a, a good uh, series of Bible studies, and I still have to finish some series on uh, words to no profit. Okay, I do still have some for that series. But a brother in Christ hit me up, and uh, someone in the brethren hit me up and asked me about doing a word study on the word barbarian. And honestly, I thought it was going to be a huge study, and I was like, I'll see if I can get around to it, but. The Lord has blessed me today. The, the whole house, I'm, it's all ready for, for summer. All I got left is I got to get that garage separated, uh, cleaned out. Uh, I did a, a garbage dump run. Um, I got the chicken coop redone, praise the Lord. We still have rain here off and on. It's still fairly cold. That's why I'm still in this sweater. Uh, for some of the brothers of Christ, I've been following this ministry for a while. During the summer, I tend to wear collar shirts uh, because it's it gets warm. But we're still kind of cool here, uh, so I'm still wearing the, the sweater off and on um, when we get rain. But I'm getting a lot of stuff done around the house, and the Lord put it on my heart to sit behind the computer and start looking into it. Just look into it. So I started looking into it, and I found out it's really not that difficult. Doing a word study in the word barbarian is not that difficult, and it's pretty simple. So let's get into a Bible study. Who wants to do a Bible study? <laughs> I do. Right. Make sure you get your King James Bibles out for English-speaking people and make sure you're following along. But before we get into the King James, I didn't, I didn't get it out, but over on the bookshelf I have the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the Webster's 1828 Dictionary and look at what they say the definition is. And then we're going to look into the Bible and see what the Bible says. And honestly, by looking into this, they don't have the definition that the Bible has at all, for the most part. Okay. So let's look at this. Barbarian, when it's used as a noun, okay, the sense is foreign, wild, fierce. Foreign, wild, fierce. Okay. Definition one they have is a man is in his rude, savage state. Rude and savage state. An uncivilized person. Okay. Um, a cruel, uh, definition number two, a cruel, savage, brutal man, one destitute of pity or humanity. Three, a foreigner. This one's kind of, when we get in there, it's kind of, it's kind of lines up, but it's not it, because there's two definitions that the Bible gives when, when the term uh, barbarian is used. But a foreigner, the Greeks and Romans, uh, demo demonstrated most foreign uh, nations barbarians and many of their these were less civilized than themselves or unacquainted with their language okay this one kind of lines up a little bit because we're going to get into it unacquainted with their language laws and manners okay. but with them the word was less reproachful than with us okay. Barbarian is an adjective, number one, belonging to savages, rude, uncivilized. Uh, definition number two is cruel or inhumane. Okay. One of the biggest things we see in, in modern world, and what I call Hollywood movies and TV shows, is they always show barbarians as these people that are half clad, okay, half naked, got swords, got weapons, and they're just, they take what they want, they kill, they rampage, and all that kind of stuff. But we're going to look at some barbarians in the Bible and see what the Bible describes what a barbarian is. Okay? But barbarian, we can get, is a Greek word to English. How we know this, it's only found in the King James Bible four times. And it's found in the New Testament Specifically, it's, it's found in the Pauline epistles. Paul's the one that uses that word. Why? Because Paul's the one who encounters barbarians. Paul is also the apostle to the Gentiles. A barbarian, you have Gentiles, and then you have a definition of all these different people that line up under Gentile. So you have Greeks, you have uh, uncircumcision, okay? You have um, barbarian. You have, uh, another word was, we'll get to it, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I had to look up the definition, but Scythian, which is, as a noun, it's a native to Cynthia, 
a name given to northern part of Asia and Europe adjoining to Asia. So it's a group of people up in that area that the Bible gives them a name. And, um, but they all fall under, fall under one uh, description that's universal and it's Gentile. You have Jews and you have Gentiles. Okay. And we're going to get into some verse that actually separates the Gentiles down into different names, but they're all Gentiles. But why are they given those names? We're not going to talk about all of them, but we will talk about barbarian. Why it, the a pe certain group of people were given the term barbarian. Okay. So, turn in your B King James Bibles to Romans 1.7. This is the second time it's used. But we're going to skip the first one and we're going to go back to it after we read this one. I'm using the big book <laughs> again. Um, I'm doing a lot of my highlighting. Um, so it's hard to grab it and try to flip through it normally. So I apologize. So Romans chapter 1 verse 7. Romans chapter 1 verse 7. To all that be in Rome, to all that be in Rome. I know we did a study before because some people say Romans is just written to, the, written to the Gentiles. It's just written to the Gentiles. No, it's written to all that be in Rome. Saved sinners in Rome. And it's going to include Jews and Gentiles. And anything that falls under the list of Gentiles that we just talked about quickly. Okay? To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. I pray, brothers and sisters Christ, that that's us, that's you, that's me, that our faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Are you praying for brothers and sisters in Christ? I desperately need prayer. I know other brothers and sisters Christ. I believe we all desperately need prayer. Make sure you're praying for each other, brothers and sisters Christ. Making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Face-to-face -face fellowship. How many of us pray for that? <laughs> I do. Verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto. And now Paul's going to explain why he's let hitherto. What's hindering him sometimes from coming and um, fellowshipping with some brethren. That I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles, Verse 14, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. So there's where we get our word barbarian. Both to the wise, Greeks, and to the unwise, barbarians. There we get our definition, our first definition of what a barbarian is. But why is it, what's hindering him from, from coming sometimes and meeting the brethren? Verse 15, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. There's Greeks that he owes the gospel to. There's barbarians that he owes the gospel to. We're going to get into that, the story of the first time he meets barbarians. Okay, He didn't preach the gospel the first time. He owes them the gospel. So what's hindering him sometimes from coming and fellowshipping with brethren? Uh, especially he's talking about here at Rome. He still has gospel to preach. That's what God's really... He's, he's an apostle to the Gentiles. He's preaching the gospel that's revealed to him by Jesus Christ. For the Gentiles, for the uh, time of the Gentiles. Okay. And it does mention Gentiles. But there's also Jews in Rome. Because you keep reading through Rome, there's a chapter, I can't remember if it's Rome, Romans... But we did a study on it where there was a chapter in one of the books that was uh, addressed to the, that they say is addressed to Gentiles, but there was a whole chapter, I think it's Romans, where he's addressing Jews. Okay. 
So it's to all that be in Rome, to all the saved, but predominantly his crowd, saved sinners, was Gentile. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. There are times, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there are times where God's going to have you keep your mouth shut and you're going to kick yourself saying, why didn't I witness to that person? And God's like, it wasn't time. God's got a time and place for everything. There's times where God's putting on my heart saying, witness to him. And, and you, when I was younger, you'd fail and you'd lose courage and you wouldn't witness to him. And then you kick yourself. But sometimes the door doesn't open. Okay. Paul's saying, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Don't get me wrong. The reason I didn't preach to him wasn't because I was ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It just wasn't time for them to hear the gospel. They weren't ready yet. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Remember, the gospel, people always get on to me, a little rabbit trail. The gospel leads to salvation. Repentance leads to salvation. Belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the gospel, leads to salvation. And repentance is part of the gospel. It leads to salvation. Confessing both in prayer leads to salvation. Asking God to save you leads to salvation. Brother says Christ, what is sal true biblical salvation? God, it's always God saving man by His grace. God doing the saving. God's the one that looks at the heart and does the saving. This is a great verse here that proves that. Oh, I'm saved by my belief. No, you're not. No, you're not. God's the one that does the saving. Okay? For it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. As it's revealed faith to faith. Whole other study for dispensational teaching. Okay, how to find God's grace is different in different parts of the Bible. We call them dispensations. From faith to faith. How do you find that grace? How do you find that salvation? From faith to faith. Today, in the, what we call the church age, is the time of the Gentiles. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Repentance is having godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. It's personal. It's one-on-one -on -one with God. Okay? That's what true biblical repentance is. And it leads to the cross. Then you can look at the cross and say, that man, Jesus Christ, who is God manifest in the flesh, God's blood was shed for me. For my sins. You skip repentance, you can't truly believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Got a lot of fakes and frauds out there. But we don't want to go too much on a tangent. We want to stick with the word barbarian. Okay. Romans 1.14 says, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians. It separates the two. They're both Gentiles, but it separates the two. Greeks, barbarians both to the wise and unwise, and you link them up. So the wise, he's talking about Greeks. To the unwise, barbarians. Now remember the Bible says for Gentiles that the Jews require a sign, and I, th I think it's the Greeks, or it says Gentiles seek after wisdom. I don't have that verse down. I don't want to confuse the verse with another verse. But they seek after wisdom. But there's some people out there that aren't seeking wisdom. Okay? They're not trying to be wise. You know, why was it Homo sapiens sapiens? No longer wise man. It's wise, wise man. Right? So the first definition we get here, a bar barbarian is considered unwise. And the debt that Paul owes them is preaching the gospel. Why was Paul in debt to the barbarians? To the unwise? They, they'll try to say it's uncivilized, okay? To the unwise. Um, a good example is you have a plate of food here and you've got a fork and you've got a, a, a knife here and they'll say when you see a man just sit there and start shoveling it in like this, man, he's eating like a barbarian. Uh, uncivilized. They try to say it's uncivilized. But more than anything, it's unwise. They don't, they're not looking to seek wisdom to be some, you know, uh, to try to bring in some like scientific 
uh, sci-fi, futuristic world type people. You know, they just live simple. Okay. Okay. They're considered, Paul uses the word unwise. They know the basics to get through each day. That's it. We call them backwards. You know how you tell the words that sometimes you, some people are called backwards people. Or people that love the, uh, the just so old and how they do things. Okay. They don't want to get up, uh, get with the program as they say. Catch up with the rest of the world. Okay. But unwise is one of the definitions of barbarian. Now why, real quick, did Paul, I said, why was Paul in debt to barbarians, to the unwise? Uh, turn to Acts 28.1. This is where we're going to get the first time barbarians used. Acts 28.1. Acts 28.1 we read, And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. Stop right there. This story is Paul. Okay, uh, One of my greatest stories where Paul's standing there trying to preach to the Jews, and then he puts the Pharisees against the Sadducees. For the resurrection am I called into question. Uh, when, he's trying to, when he's being called into question, he's preaching Jesus Christ, which is the resurrection. Jesus Christ who died, was buried, and rose again the third day, proving that he is God, fully and completely. And they start arguing, and he's, he's like, he's, they're going to kill him. So what does he do? He uses, God gives him wisdom. He uses his head. He sets them against each other. Oh, for the resurrection, am I called into question? Remember, Pharisees believe in the resurrection. Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. So they go at it. Paul gets put into prison. And then Paul appeals to Caesar. So he goes to Felix. And Felix is like, if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, thou persuadest, thou persuadest me to be a Christian? He was almost set loose, but he appealed to Caesar. So they put him in a ship. And they're shipping him to Rome. They're shipping him to Caesar. And the ship, there's a huge storm. Paul tells the, the centurions and everything, he says, we shouldn't get on this ship. The voyage is set for disaster. But they wouldn't listen to him. They got on the ship anyway. And there's a huge storm. There's a big disaster. They wanted to kill all the prisoners. I'm just, barely, I'm just going over everything. But the boat crashes. It wrecks. And they wreck onto an island. And everybody makes it to the island safe. Okay. And when they had escaped, the ship crashed, then they knew that the island was called Melita. They found out afterwards what the island was called, but they didn't know what the island was called when they were initially on the shipwreck, swimming for shore, and they're wondering. And here it is. And the barbarous people, that's the only time in the Bible you'll see the word barbarous. I looked that up too to see if there was more, but it's just right here. Barbarous people showed us no little kindness. It didn't say they didn't show us any kindness. It was saying the kindness wasn't little. So what's the opposite of little? Great. Because they showed us no little kindness. This is barbarous people. But they weren't like going around killing people with swords and just going crazy. That's Hollywood. This barbarous people showed us no little kindness. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. Okay. Once again, I'd like to make the point that this is the only time barbarous is used in the King James Bible. And it's talking about barbarians. Okay. Acts 28.3. Keep reading. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fashioned on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves... That's key words, among themselves. No doubt this man is a murderer whom, thou, thou, if, whom though he had escaped the sea, yet, vengefully, but yet vengeance suffereth not to live. Now stop right there. These are barbarians, yet the laws of God are written on every man's heart. They know what a murderer is? Backward people on an island, isolated from the rest of the world, they know what a murderer is? Okay. They always say, well, what if Jesus is... 
they, they have the laws of God written on every man's heart. With the laws of God, they're a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. When they're in the right mindset, God's going to send someone to them to preach to them. No doubt this man's a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast, the beast into the fire, Paul, and felt no harm, because he's an apostle. This is evidence that he's an apostle. This proves that he was the twelfth apostle chosen by God, not the man that they chose in Acts. And he shook off the beast in the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a lowercase g God. Okay. Their mindset wasn't ready. The laws of God are written on every man's heart, but their mindset wasn't ready. Verse 7, In the same quarters were possessions of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also which had diseases in the island came and were healed. Paul's healing. There's miracles. Okay, the sign gifts haven't gone away. Not yet. Because there's still, he has to get, if you remember our studies in the past, if you're new, I have other studies on this video, on, on, the, on this YouTube channel. I've got other studies where we talk about how Paul still had a group of Jews that he was going to preach to in Rome. He's not there yet. He preached to the Jews three times before the sign gifts went away. You know, I always tell you about the three strike rule. Three, not that I'm into sports too much, but I was at one time. But three strikes. Okay? They went to the Jews and preached Jesus to the Jews. Paul did it three times. And the third time hasn't happened yet. And on the third time when he preaches to Rome, at Rome, he's like, I'm done. The sign gifts go away. Okay. But right now the sign gifts are still here. But he's healing people. But when we get this finished with this, notice the one thing that's missing from this. Let's see if you guys get it. Brothers says Christ. Verse 10. Who also honored us with many honors. And when we departed, they laded us with such things as was necessary. And after three months, we three months, they were there for three months. We departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle, whose sign was Castor and Pollux. They left. What's missing here? Paul didn't preach the gospel. There's a time and place for anything. Paul didn't preach the gospel. Also notice when they said... Um, when they, said, when they talked among themselves, notice all this interaction, it's not showing the, the people themselves talking to them, talking to Paul. Right. We'll get to that, because the second definition is uh, unknown language, unknown tongue. When you have someone that is a, a barbarian, he's unwise, and he speaks in an unknown tongue that's not known to anybody. Nobody can translate. There is no... Uh, interpretation. Okay. But I wanted to point that out. Okay. The gospel was not preached to them at this time. God has a time and place for everything. Paul owed them the gospel. That's what he was in debt to them. He owed them the gospel. Okay. What prevented Paul from going t around to um, visiting people sometimes? Uh, like Rome, and going, uh, he wanted to visit the churches, uh, the church of Corinth, the church of Ephesus, and so on. What prevented him sometimes? He owed people the gospel. I had to get the gospel to these people. I wish I could come to you, brother and sister Christ, but I owe this group of people over here the gospel. God says it's time. I need to go over and preach to them. Now they're ready. Not all of them, but there's people that are ready. Now's the time to do it. So we see barbarians as being unwise, 
Now the word they try to use in the definition of the Webster's 1820 is uncivilized, okay? Uh, but they're not they're unwise, is what the Bible uses unwise. But one is saved when one is saved by God's grace. What happens after salvation? Okay, because some people say born again barbarian. Uh, you can have a barbarian that's born again, but born again barbarian means that you can be born again and remain a barbarian. When you're born again, you can remain unwise. Well, Jane, you don't have to turn here, but James 1.5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and braideth not, and it shall be given him. The Bible also talks about what God thinks of the wisdom of, the wor of this world. Has he not made foolish the wisdom of this world? But when you truly get saved and born again, you're no longer a barbarian. God opens your eyes and gives you wisdom. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work when it needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? It's more accurately to say you can have a barbarian that becomes born again. Okay? Just throw that out there real quick. Notice when, the, real quick again, notice when the barbarians spoke, they said among themselves, because nobody else could understand them. I believe no one else could understand them. How do we know this? When we get to the next definition. But they said among themselves, the Holy Spirit helped Paul to discern what was in their heart, is what I believe, by, by comparing Scripture with Scripture. You go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 14.1. That's where we're going to get the second definition of barbarian that I'm already kind of explaining a little bit now. Because we saw a situation that where they're speaking, but they're speaking among themselves. But I believe no one knew what they were saying out loud. Foreign language that no one knew. Which leads us to the second, why barbarian is used in the Bible. Second definition of barbarian. 1 Corinthians 14.1 It's amazing how you can get a different view of what truth is when you read the Bible and you go by what the Bible's telling us versus what the world's trying to tell us. Okay? Don't be one of those people that's starting to go the way of the world and going to the world's definitions and using the world's way of doing things. Let's get back to the Bible. First definition, unwise. A barbarian is, is a group of people that are unwise. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. At least I'm in 1 Corinthians. Sometimes I'll like go all the way to 2, I mean, I need to get into 2 Corinthians, and I stop at 1 Corinthians on accident. But 1 Corinthians 14, 1. 15. I'm opening this, but i got highlighted here in my notes. So I'm reading from my notes, but... I'm turning with you to give you time to turn too. But you can always pause the video, remember, and turn with me. 1 Corinthians 14.1 reads, Follow after charity. Remember what charity is. Today it's being perverted. True charity is self-sacrifice. Summed up, it's self-sacrifice. Charity isn't me keeping my yap shut so you can do whatever you want, believe whatever you want, say whatever you want, live however you want. You're heading for destruction, but if I have true destruction, charity for you I keep my mouth shut that's not charity don't fall for that lie that some of the some I want to say brethren that are getting messed messed up with the world are putting out there true charity is self sacrifice right giving of yourself sacrificing something for someone else that's true charity right follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts now, as we go down here, I don't think it talks about it, but one of the spiritual gifts is the discernment of tongues. Some people are blessed uh, with um, being able to interpret different languages, known languages of the world. They can get the language down, they listen to it, they, they, they spend time with people, they learn the language. Okay? And you know something? That just hit me. Uh, they weren't ready yet. But the other reason I believe Paul owed them the gospel and didn't preach them at the time is because he couldn't speak to them at the time. There was no interpreter. So he had to wait to when somebody, since they landed on the island, you had some people starting to go, now that they know those people are there, you've got people going there, they're trading with them. you got people that start learning the basic language and then start learning. Like, then you have someone that can interpret for you and you can preach the gospel to them. There was no interpreter. There's no way for Paul to preach the gospel to them. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. 
For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now we're not going to get into the speaking in tongues part, but you're not supposed to speak in a language that people can't understand you. I pray to God, I speak English when I pray to God. That's my language. Okay. But what this is saying is you've got people that are trying to say you have to have a heavenly language. You have to speak in tongues. That's a heavenly, an unknown language that's evidence of the Holy Spirit, which is false. Okay. But let's see what Paul has to say about this. Verse 3, But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So if you're speaking a language that nobody understands, you can't edify, you can't exhort, and you can't comfort. It's chaos. Verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Makes yourself feel good. I was in those battle buildings, uh, four square ministries, where they had everything from uh, old-fashioned church service to... Uh, the charismatic heart, wing nuts, as you want to say, to the um, rock and roll church services. I mean, they had different buildings spread out throughout California and Oregon and, and probably a couple other states. Um, so I've been into some of those buildings where they're just, they're going nuts, dancing in the aisle and speaking gibberish. And when you look at it, it's all about edifying themselves to make themselves feel good. It's all flesh. It's not of God. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. He wants, people, he wants you to pray and speak to the Lord. Absolutely. But when you're talking in front of other people, he'd rather you prophesy. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he interpret it. Except he interpret it. He throws that in. You can speak, speak in tongues and it gets interpreted. No interpretation. That's a whole other verse. We're not going to get into it. Like I said, we're not going to get into tongues. We're going to get into the part where he uses barbarian as an example of someone speaking in tongues. But tongues is, uh, is known languages in the Bible. Okay, there's got to be an interpreter and it's known languages in the Bible. Speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Edifying. Verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying. Revelation, knowledge, prophesying. Or by doctrine. Imagine us getting our doctrine from some heavenly language that nobody understands. We'd never be able to get doctrine. I'm glad we have doctrine in our language, okay, in a language we can understand. Verse 7, And even, and even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds. You know, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? When it comes time for war, they blow a trumpet. It's time for war. It also reminds me of the uh, uh, pre-time Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. There's going to be a trumpet. It's, uh, the, uh, the trump of God, the voice that he makes. Okay, why? Because we're going to go up and God's going to start pouring his wrath out on this world. Okay. Um, there's going to be a trumpet sounded when Jesus comes down. He comes twice. He comes in the clouds to take us home before the time of Jacob's trouble. He comes the second time where he comes all the way down with the horse and in the battle of Armageddon. But when someone blows a horn, if, if someone's blowing a flute, people are going to be like, what's that? What are we supposed to do? But if they blow a trumpet, because that's what they used to use for battles and war. I was in the military. So you have the bugle. It's time to get up. If the bugle's going on, do 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 It means it's time to get up and start the day. But imagine laying there and you just have this soft flute playing. Do 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 I don't know how to do it, but you know what I'm saying? Just something soft and you're just like, uh, are you going to get up? No. It's confusion. There has to be distinction. You need that bugle going in the military. When we were in the military, wake you up in the morning. It's time to get up. I, mean, I know technology changed, but back then, 
before my day, they used the bugle because they didn't have the technology that they have today. There's, you know, not everybody had watches and, and clocks and everything and, and speaker systems that could turn on. When I was in basic training, they'd turn on the speaker system and yell at everybody, time to get up. Sometimes you'd hear the bugle through the speaker system in, in, the, in the barracks. But there's got to be distinctions what Paul's saying. There's got to be distinction, understanding. Verse 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. You're speaking to the air. You're wasting your breath. You're wasting oxygen. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. Now, voice here, I believe he's talking about is languages. Okay. 11. Therefore, here we go, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a, speaketh a barbarian. I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian. And he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. He'll have no clue what I'm saying, and I have no clue what he's saying. There's no interpreter. Okay. Verse 12. Even so ye, forasmuch as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church, not your flesh. The church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue... That's what I mean by the meaning of the voice. Unknown tongue, pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. There's no fruit. Okay. Now we're not going to go into tongues. I thought this study is about. The study is about barbarian. It's used there. Colossians 3.11 says, Where there is neither... I'm sorry. Uh, it's used there in verse 11. First Corinthians 14, 11, it says, Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, the language that's being spoken, I shall be to him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. I, under I don't understand what he's saying, and he doesn't understand what I'm saying. No interpreter. So we have a barbarian as being unwise in the Bible, and speaking in a way that would, as a whole, does... Which, a way that the world as a whole does not understand. It's a language that the world, that there's no interpreter. The world as a whole doesn't understand. So you have a group of people that have been isolated from the world and nobody's gone there to learn their language so they could talk to them. Mm -hmm. So, Brother Jesus Christ, those are the two definitions that you find in the King James Bible for barbarian. They're unwise, and they speak a language where there's no interpreter. Nobody understands what they're saying. Okay? Those are the two definitions of barbarian. Last time barbarians used is in Colossians 3.11. Turn to Colossians 3.11. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew. Now remember, gen a Greek is a Gentile. Gentiles, like I was talking about earlier, is, gen is generally used, you can just sum up everybody other than a Jew under Gentile. But if you want to break it down, you have Greeks, whether there's neither Greek nor Jew. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. The reason he has to throw this in there is remember, there was Greeks that were circumcised, and then there was Jews that weren't circumcised. Timothy, I think it was Timothy, I want to make sure. I've had a long day and I'm tired, I just don't want to screw up. But uh, I think it was Timothy or Titus but that one of them had to get circumcised. Their mother was a Jew, their father was a, Je uh, was a Greek, but they, they were Jewish. They had Jewish blood in them, but they weren't circumcised. Okay, so that's why I believe God separated this out, because you have where there's neither Greek nor Jew, then it separates it out to be more distinctly so people can't argue and debate over it. Circumcision nor uncircumcision. So regardless. Okay. Then it throws in barbarian. People that are, un a, a group of people that are unwise and speak in a language that there's no translation yet. There's no interpreter yet. 
Scythian, I, mean, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, uh, it could be Scythian, Scythian, or Scythian, uh, bond nor free, okay, sl slave, or someone who's free, but Christ is all and in all. So we get to that verse. Cynthia, remember we're talking about as a noun, native to, to, to either Cynthia or Scythia. A name given to the northern part of Asia and Europe adjoining to Asia. Okay, it's, it's basically trying to break down Gentiles and you have the Jews there. Okay. Basically, Christ is in all. Make sure I say that right. But Christ is all and in all. You get saved and born again, you're saved and born again. You're sealed into the day of redemption. Doesn't matter if you were originally, your background, you come from one of these things. Whether you were a Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision. Remember, you can be uncircumcised and get circumcised. Doesn't matter. Now you fall under the circumcision. Doesn't matter. Christ is, is all and in all. Barbarian. Outside the Greek Empire. Okay. Bond nor free. Okay. Holy Spirit comes in and guides you into all truth and gives you God's word to hide in your heart and speak. When we speak to people, it is in a way that they can understand us. I just have to throw that in there because there's people that are just, I guess that's what brought up the word barbarian because some people are getting so caught up in culture um, and misusing the word heritage because heritage, heritage and culture are not the same thing. Okay. But that's another Bible study, another Bible word study. Uh, we'll talk, we'll touch on it just a little bit at the end. But people are getting into the barbarian and the culture and, and the, the, the sci-fi and, I call it sci-fi, but the, the lies you get from Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games. And, um, but these people that Paul met, remember, they weren't crazy and out of control. Okay. They helped him. Hey, come here, we've made fire. They probably use sim symbols. They like they point at the fire and go, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're cold. We gotta we gotta get warmed up and everything. And they tried to use hand signals or best they could because they couldn't understand their language. But when you get saved, you get put under a new heritage, which we'll talk about in just a second. But John 16, 13 says, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will. It's guaranteed. If you're truly saved and born again, you have a love of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You'll have a love of the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Truth. That truth comes in. The Holy Spirit comes in. Okay? Um, all scripture is given by inspiration, is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Remember what Paul said, talking about doctrine. When we're preaching instruction in righteousness and doctrine, if you do it in a language that nobody can understand, it's unfruitful. Okay. But when you get saved, you're no longer a barbarian. Psalms 119.11 Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's where you get that one. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Remember what the Bible says that we, when we were lost, we were without God and without capital G God and without hope in the world? These barbarians are without capital G God and without hope in the world. They're on their way to hell. They're without hope. Someone needs to preach hope to them. Paul didn't preach to them at the first time because I believe that it wasn't time. But one of the big factors is that they, there was a language barrier. There's no interpreter. Uh, Paul owed them the gospel. And Paul, I believe, later went back and preached the gospel to them. Because he just talked about, I'm in debt to the barbarians. I owe them a debt. And then he starts talking about salvation. i got to preach salvation to them. Okay. 
Some will say Colossians just talking spiritually, okay, not physically. So they're trying to say, in other words, if they were trying to say that a Jew gets saved, they're still from the bloodline of Jews. If a Gentile gets saved, they're still a bloodline to whatever they were before they got saved, okay? Yes, I understand. There's Germans. There's different um, kindreds. The Bible word is kindreds out there. But what they're really trying to say here is they're trying to say that you can keep your culture. Okay, barbarians, they get saved and born again and they remain barbarians. By the Bible definition, they remain unwise. They remain... Uh, um, nobody can talk to them. They remain where you can't talk. They have no an unknown tongue. They remain an unknown tongue. Nobody can talk to them. They can't talk to anybody else. They can't, what we just read there, be reason of hope that is in you. They can't be ready to give an answer. Right? No, they're no longer a barbarian. Someone has come and preached the gospel to them. And they've accepted Jesus Christ. They repented, true bill of repentance, believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ and who Jesus Christ is, uh, confessed both in prayer and asked God to save them. And now they want to know, okay, now what does God want for me in this life? Here's the word of God. There's a lot of mis uh, missionaries that went around the world at one time when this book came out, the King James Bible. They went out and that's how they did it. They had to learn the language. There was a language barrier that prevented them from preaching the gospel. First thing they had to do was learn the language. First thing they had to do was start teaching them a little bit about themselves. Okay. Bringing them up a little bit. Not force them to live as I do, but explain why are you wearing this kind of clothing? Why do you eat with a fork? We eat with our hands. Why are you eating with a fork and a spoon? You start teaching a little bit about yourself. And then you teach in the gospel. You preach the gospel to them. Okay. But they say that it's spiritual. Yes, it is spiritual. It is spiritual. But that spiritual application will always reflect in the life that you live. I, I'm, I, my dad, my dad was uh, adopted, and he died when I was two years old. So I can't go off my dad's side. I can only go off my mom's side. I can't remember. I think it's Scottish. I really didn't look into it too much. Scottish or Irish? It's one of the two. I'm thinking Scottish. But that life, that culture, I was born in America, so yeah, that culture is way over there. But still, I was born in America. The American culture, I want nothing to do with. Nothing to do with American culture, okay? Uh, culture is a lot, you won't find that word in the Bible. It's a lost world's word to use to try to justify bringing in stuff that goes against the Bible. I'm looking at my battery, I forgot to plug it in, and it's getting low. So let's get in here real quick. Do I believe it's cult, uh, spiritual? Yes. Remember Romans chapter 8. Go ahead and turn to Romans, pause it and turn to Romans chapter 8. If you have to, I'll go ahead and turn real quick, but I'm afraid that battery might go out. <laughs> And I'll have to plug it in, start again. And we'll get back to where we left off. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is a great chapter, okay, that talks about this. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. You see, when this nation was founded, it had a zero tolerance for sodomy. Zero tolerance for sodomy. They had a lot of by of men and government that believed in this book, live, uh, uh, was living this book, okay? That's why the Ten Commandments were in the schools. That's why you had Bible verses in uh, government buildings, okay? They feared God, and they had a zero tolerance for sodomy. Now today we're told that sodomy is just part of the American culture. Satan wiggling things in. Okay, don't mistake, and culture is not the same thing as heritage. Okay, we're going to get into that real quick. But culture is not the same thing as heritage. Okay, when you get saved and born again, this is your heritage. Okay, this will tell you how you're supposed to live your life now. The do's and the don'ts. What you're supposed to believe. What you're supposed to be looking forward to, that blessed hope. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes in and says, here's God's Word, it's perfect, the King James Bible, uh, for English-speaking people. It's perfect. The Holy Spirit comes in and starts guiding you, saying, this is how you live your life. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. Okay? Now, I understand there's different areas of the world where you have to learn different things on how to grow things, but everybody grows things. Okay? Everybody makes clothes. You need clothes to wear to stay warm during the winter. Everyone does it. It might be different a little bit depending on where you are. Okay, I understand that. But my main point is, is when you get into culture, it's more anything Satan's way of trying to infiltrate things in that have nothing to do with you making something to keep yourself warm. It's culture to have that uh, uh, pagan star on your, you know, the five-pointed star on your your fur coat or whatever, you have to put it on there because it's our culture. That's where culture comes in. Heritage is different. Okay. But after the Spirit, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. When I got saved and born again, I wasn't, I didn't care about my culture, American culture. Okay. I cared about what does God want me to do? My flesh is so wicked. My life is so wicked. God, I need help. And He had to, and God gave me the strength and He helped me clean up my life bit by bit. Get that out. Start doing this. Make sure you're reading your Bible every morning. Read your Bible every night. Make sure you're singing hymns. Make sure you're reading the, uh, reading the Word uh, prayer. Watching Bible studies. Get bad things out of your life. Get good things into your life the Bible promotes. Okay? But they that are after the Spirit... Verse 5 of the Spirit. For the, I lost my place. Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things that are the spirits. This is where your focus is. Not the world. This. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If so be, if. It's the Bible if. Paul's saying, you might not be saved. You could be a false convert. If so be the Spirit of God dwell in you. This is one of the examples of someone who's truly saved and born again. This is what matters, not the world. Okay. Living for Jesus Christ, keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ every day, not living for the world and keeping your eyes on the world every day. Culture. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of life because of righteousness. Now remember, brother says Christ, when you witness to somebody that's in another country, what they call another culture, and you lead them to Christ, and they start living a life of Christ, they're going to be set apart from their people. Because half, if not more, of what they do, or won't do, is because of their culture they found out was had pagan ties, pagan backgrounds, it was wickedness, it was sin. They might be okay with it, but I'm born again, I'm not, and God says it's wrong, so therefore I'm not okay with it, I'm not doing it anymore. You change. You are set apart. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. Verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, remember what we read up there? Got to do it one more. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, synth, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in you all. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, remember the blessed hope, therefore we're only two-thirds redeemed. This body has not been redeemed. 
But therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if, we, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of, of bondage again to fear. In other words, you're not, you, you can't lose your salvation in this dispensation. You are sealed into the day of redemption. If you have Jesus Christ in you, you are sealed into the day of redemption. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, where, where we cry, Abba, Father. I'm adopted into a new family. I have a new heritage. Okay. New heritage. What is heritage? Okay. I'm just going to talk, stop, we're going to use the verse, 1 Peter 5, 3. Okay. If you want to pause and turn there, you can pause and turn there. But I'm just going to read it real quick. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. God's heritage. Okay. Heritage as a noun, it has two definitions according to the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Inheritance, an estate that's passed from an ancestor to an heir by descent or course of law, that which is inherited. Two, in Scripture, the saints or people of God are called his heritage as being claimed by him and the object of his special care. Okay. We are now in God's heritage. The Old Testament, God chose a people, the Jewish people, and set them out from the rest of the world. They'll, you'll hear people say, well, it's just Jewish culture. No, you had men, Jewish men that tried to bring in their own rules and regulations. That's why Jesus was always clashing with the Pharisees, because they weren't going off with God's commands. But when you have Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, when you have Jacob, and the twelve tribes come in, okay, there was heritage, People passing things down, but um, Abraham's stuff became Isaac's. Okay, Isaac, the whole, you have to look at the story, but Isaac's stuff became uh, Esau's, and Jacob had to go out, and, he, and God blessed him and got him his own stuff. But there's heritage where things are passed down from father to son, father to son. Uh, you have Moses where there's women that didn't have fathers, didn't have husbands. Um, some kind of inheritance things where they had to get that sorted out. Okay, there is inheritance when it comes to that, but when it comes to the Jewish people, they're God's chosen people. It's not Jewish culture. The Jews were set apart and were given commandments by God, Moses through Moses, on how to live. The do's and the don'ts. Why? So they'd be set apart from the world. These are my people, and they're set apart from the world. Guess what, brother says Christ? As Christians today, guess what we're supposed to be? We're now, we get adopted in, the adoption, we just read there, the spirit of adoption. We now get adopted in, and we are now part of God's people, God's children. Now are we the sons of God? We're supposed to be set apart from this world. We're supposed to, we're given commands. Jesus said, um, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. At the cross, when you give your life to Christ, you keep reading that verse. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Evidence that you gave your life to Jesus Christ at the cross. What's your attitude towards God's commands? He gives you the commands, the do's and the don'ts, to separate you from the rest of the world. Don't get yoked up with the rest of the world. Okay. Now, I went and looked into heritage a little bit, but that kind of lines up with what heritage is in the Bible. We are now adopted in and given that heritage. Now we can end up, if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. We now have a part in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ as Gentiles. Okay. Uh, we now have uh, uh, Gentiles as a whole, the door has been opened for salvation. In the Old Testament, I believe, you, I don't want to get too off there, but I believe in the Old Testament there were some Gentiles that got saved. Okay. Uh, there was Gentiles that got circumcised and observed the laws of Moses. And I believe there were some, some Gentiles that got saved, but it's predominantly just Jews in the Old Testament from uh, J Jacob and on. That's when they're Jews. Okay. So, barbarian, it's so simple. Barbarian, I know we talked about this for a while, so, but barbarian, the definition is a barbarian is one that's unwise and one that speaks in an unknown tongue. There's no interpreter. 
Okay? That's the Bible definition of barbarian. Okay? That's why Paul couldn't go and preach the gospel the first time he, he shipwrecked on the island. He didn't know their language. He didn't have someone with him that could interpret between them so he could preach Jesus Christ to them. Okay? God, everything in God's time, it wasn't their time to hear the gospel. Paul came back later and preached the gospel to them. But a barbarian in the Bible is someone that's unwise and speaks in an unknown language, an unknown tongue with no interpreter. There is no interpreter. Okay? That's what the Bible uses. And Paul's the one that uses it four times. Okay? You can say five if you want to use the word barbarous. But barbarian is used four times by Paul. So hopefully you've liked this word study and you followed along. Um, so we're going to end this study with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I will see you guys, brothers and sisters Christ, in the next study. I'm praying for you. Please pray for me, especially in these last days. And let's get back to what matters. Let's get back to what matters. Hiding this in your heart living it, preaching this to each other, teaching this to each other, just talking about God's Word. Look what God showed me. Let's get back to what matters. Not worldly culture, worldly heritage. This is what matters. Okay? So I'll say it again. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with May grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus. I pray all is well with all of you and I will see you in the next Bible study we do.